Cheers and welcome to From Behind the Barcast, the podcast for bartending, service industry, drinking in general. I'm Pax and Eugene. We have craft services Kelly over there on the That's ones right. and twos. And continuing with our weeks of amazing guests, Andrew Robertson, thanks for coming on to the show. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah, dude, it's been a long time coming. Uh, we're brought to you by FiremakerBeer.com. Uh, check out their website for more details or call Mike O'Connor personally. His number is 900. <laughs> speaking of uh all right so i don't commit to a lot of things i'm an old man okay change is scary to me i look at the world and i go oh, what's going on i don't understand things also don't like a big uh like online footprint for the most part in terms of like signing up for a million things with all of your uh would you say you like a big thumbprint <laughs> hey i don't like a big th- look at that we're already rolling baby with the callback or the pre-calls for the callbacks. <laughs> so I uh, put a number in my phone today. Last week, um, so my car, uh, Huckapoo's babysits my car from Thursday until Monday because I drive to work on a Thursday morning. Typically, I might drink by the time I'm done working that Thursday. So I always walk home and leave my car there. <clears throat> I work on Saturdays and Sundays, so I just walk to work, uh, you know, and I get all my business done during the week. You know, I don't need to go to the grocery store or the bank or anything like that over the weekend. So I don't really need the car. So last week, um, I was I always walk uh, before the podcast to go get my car on Mondays. And I was like, uh, Zunzi Bar, um, I haven't been there since it's been on the island, which has been like, I don't know, two years or something like that. Has it been that long? I think so. Jeez. Yeah, maybe, yeah. 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 And because I don't go out to eat a lot, generally yeah you know like i'll cook at home a lot you know <clears throat> and uh so i was like you know what when i walked to get my car last monday i was like i'm gonna call in an order pick me up a conquistador let's go so i call in girl answers i was like hey could i make a pickup order she goes yeah sure just give me one second boopity boopity boop i'll order and i walk up there <clears throat> so on the menu online there's nowhere clear where it says uh it's like cash only not a huge Problem. I'm not cash only. Uh, no cash. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry, no cash. About to say, let's yeah, no <laughs> cash. So I get up there, and the girl's pretty nice. You know, I was like, I start pull out cash. She goes, um, yeah, listen, we're uh, we're in no cash. I was like, yeah, understandable. So she pulls out the big machine. She's like, tap your card, and I start trying to tap. She's like, at the top. I was like, all right, I'm an old man. Whatever, I get it. You know, like I got felt a little shade, but you know, let's let's. <laughs> move. That's what we do, man. It is what it is. We're in the service and. So I uh, get my sandwich, and it was amazing. This week, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make this a thing. Every Monday when I walk to work, or walk back to work to get my car, I'm going to order Zunzi. So I call him. To, so I, pl- I program the number into my phone. Kind of a big deal. Save the number. Save the number. <laughs> so I called. Um, uh, they go, oh, hello, uh, Zunzi. Bye. This is Megan. Hey, could I make a uh, pickup order? She goes, um, actually, we only take orders online. Uh, no so what i didn't say was well last week <laughs> i call you know because what's well, th- you're being a darren if you pull that that's one. what i'm saying well give last week the girl you know whatever there's there's no need for it whatever i was like okay so i go to place the order online and it's like filling out a tax return yeah full form two pages yes <laughs> yeah uh, and initials. then you have to give them your email so that they <laughs> barrage you with email phone number yeah all those things right so i placed the order and it goes uh uh what kind of bread would you like I was like yeah you know the the french bread whatever and then it goes uh add provolone i was like hold on i think the conquistador already has provolone on it. yes it does would you like to add parmesan i think it's already got parmesan <laughs> i get down i get done ordering and then it's email phone number you know credit card information all that stuff fine but then it's like, do you want to sign up for Toast, which is their online portal to make the okay. orders? And I was like, no. You know, yeah. I don't want to get emails. Well, I tried to not do it, and it took me another five minutes before I was like, I couldn't get the order through. I was like, sign me up. So then they sent me a confirmation code. They so wore then, me down. Yeah, they got me. So then I was like. Uh, it's like the Comcast of POS <laughs> systems. For real. <laughs> So, uh, so I get up there and, uh, I, I'm like, Hey, I have a to go order. I guess, you know, my name would be on it. And I look over and on the bar sits my order with a ticket 
Keister flapping in the wind for the entire world to see. My Con name. Keister. My name, my address, my, my email, my phone number. And the thing was, the thing that I thought of immediately was, all right, so if you're going to, if you're a place that's like uh, not going to give like clear info about not, not doing cash or, you know, having to order online, this is how you should answer the phone. Zunzi's, what you want? <laughs> Don't answer the phone. Hello. Thank you for calling Zunzi's. This is MAGA. With the whole corporate. Like, yeah. You got to have a smile when you answer the phone. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah they, uh, could t- they could tell you're smiling over the phone. I was like, listen, man, just go Zunzi's, whatever you want. And then you were, you're set up for understanding what the product, like, because look, I work at Huckapoo's. I'm not the nicest guy, but I treat everyone the same until until they don't treat me the same. And then I'm a dick, whatever. And, but when I answer the phone at Poo's, I go, Huckapoo's, hey, yes or no, whatever. So, and then, and then I get up there, or as I'm going up there, uh, my, my phone beep buzzes, and I was like, this text message from goddamn app texting me telling your, you your order's, your order's ready? ready i was like this is too big brother i i can't uh, and i'm gonna so then i'm i'm kind of like i'm going through all this in my mind i was like i've walked by there and it's like wednesday and they got a, a loud ass singer songwriter guitar player out there way louder than he needs to be there's only three people listening my buddy lives right behind him and he's like man they on a wednesday night no one's there and they've got the it's louder than a band and it's just like a guitar player so all this stuff's flooding through my head, and I get I, I get in my car and I drive home, open the box, I take a bite of the sandwich, and I was like, whatever, it's worth it. <laughs> this this conquistador, you know, it's a hell of a sandwich. sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. Conquered by the conquistador yet I, again. I have to say, the last time I went to Zunzi's wasn't long ago. It might have been a month ago, and it was the the Drayton uh, Drayton location. Obviously, their their newer location downtown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For anybody that had been to their original takeout spot but yeah. but uh but yeah so prior to that maybe a year and went from i'm i'm gonna complain a little bit went from paying 16 bucks for a whole sandwich to 16 bucks for a half sandwich or 22 bucks for the whole and well, yeah. you know, moving out of the small space, you know, I mean, overhead's going to be a little higher. Oh, no, I, I get it. Yeah, 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 But, you know, you're, you're used to something. You know? Right. You're used oh, to it, slipping that shoe on. I was talking about going from Zoom, from the same location like, oh, right. like yeah, a yeah. year later, and it just caught me off guard. But, but uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not harping on anybody. I get inflation definitely hit but, everybody. But, God damn, that sandwich is good. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, will, I will order it 10 out of 10. The reason I bring that up. Always go for the whole. It's worth the extra six bucks. Unquestionable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's why I started that. <laughs> yeah, right. Just don't even worry about that. Yeah, yeah don't even worry go about that. Go for the extra. whole. Trust me, you want it. And I'm a Godfather guy. I like the Godfather. Oh, okay. Well, That's what's my on? sandwich there. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. It's the two sausages and then uh, uh, two types of sausage and then the chicken. I knew you were a two oh, sausage. Oh, yeah. I've always been a two sausage <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um. Uh, we have like so much uh, history, and we've been friends for a very long time. And uh, we've definitely worked. It's one in, way to put it. <laughs> and we've worked in the same um, orbit, you know, for a while, like doing different things, whether it be bar, musician, whatever. But um, uh, the first, you know, when I met you, I would met um, your brother Brendan before you, I think, and then I, th- I think I met Daniel, and then you, you were. That'd be fair because You're I was probably back bar backing at that point, yeah. if even. That yeah. might have been Loco's days still. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Pre-live wire. Right, yeah. So, yeah, and that's a that's a whole nother episode in itself. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. Pre-live wire. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Um, but, but, yeah, so that totally makes sense because when, when we first started Live Wire Sounds, Inc., I was 14, Brendan was 16, and we were operating out of my dad's garage. That was like a production company for music, like doing backline and sound? Yeah. Okay, exactly. Yeah. So, so Brendan was doing sound, you were like I was, lugging amps around? Yeah, shit. because yeah. I was grew up as the athlete, or as an athlete, yeah. I was neck down labor until <laughs> yeah. uh, until <laughs> Brendan finally, like... It taught me a thing or two about plugging things in. That, that, that name covers a lot of ground. <laughs> <laughs> Neck down labor, I love it. And, and so, so yeah, so, it, I mean. 
so then it was pretty natural that you would move into the music venue space a little bit because what you guys uh the space you guys ended up occupying was a very staple savannah institution jj cagney's right so uh for our non-savannah listeners who aren't familiar so jj cagney's back in the day it's uh uh, on River Street, and it was on or it's, it was on River Street and uh, and Bay, and Bay. Um, but it was as a live as live music venues go in Savannah. There's a lot of restaurant bars that happen to do live music, you know, on the weekends or whatever, right. or like your fiddlers and shit like that. But Cagney's, and then by way of Livewire, were the very music focused bar venues, right? That booked the kinds of acts that you would like to see coming through town that weren't just like, you know, the typical bar bands necessarily, even though you guys did book those as well. Yeah. It was always less of a corner stage in some of these. I, I mean, I know that you're obviously familiar with Bayou cafe and mm. that's its own staple and had incredible foundation that was actually owned by the same people that, had jj Cagney. oh really okay yeah so the zambitos okay and, gotcha yeah because we had tom morley on uh, a couple weeks ago yeah. you know and he bartended at the bayou forever right yeah yeah i mean that's where i met him and yeah yeah uh and so vince was actually one of our partners and, vince was one of your partners at yeah. livewire right yeah mm -hmm. uh so it was the robertson family right uh the mccormick brothers and then and vince. then vince yeah yep so uh so you guys came in, and this is right on the cusp of me being a, a professional-ish musician that played out. And the thing that uh, you guys brought to the Savannah m music scene was, like I said, booking those touring acts that aren't big enough to do, like, the Civic Center or something like that, but were good enough to, like, you would want to go to a music venue to see them, where it's like, it was focused on music, you know? And you guys nurtured me and all the bands that I was in, like Mr. Wiley to start with. And then when I was doing Thumbprint, the electronic stuff, you guys always booked me. Then on Dakota Monday, you know. So just a little love and appreciation for what you guys contributed, especially to the Savannah music scene, because it gave guys gigs outside of just playing other bars and stuff. But also it opened up a, a lot of people's minds to like these touring acts, small touring acts that most people wouldn't have seen. So what? when did you guys start? live wire was like 2007 or 8 2008 so march of 2008 just before st patrick's day and so that's a that's quite feet in the fire yeah. to, to start with yeah, yeah. I, think our, I think our soft opening was like march 2nd i wow. mean it was it, it was but everybody that worked for us I, I was bar backing then and so i cut my teeth behind the bar at Livewire bar backing for my eldest brother and a bunch of people that worked at Locos. And I mean, we, we handpicked and cherry picked a number of bartenders throughout Savannah and but just, it just made it a little bit easier. And it was a bunch of vets. So sure. Yeah. Th there's an important part of like uh, how you're choosing your staff, especially early on to make sure you got some vets in there that might not stay for the long, you know, but that can get you, get you rolling but I, I i just remember over the years like uh especially a lot by like not a ton of staff turnover so first six months we probably had or when we first opened we probably overhired by like however many sure. tens of or 20 people sure uh with the expected attrition of any new bar or restaurant and uh whether they were friends or coworkers at another place or not, it just you know that there's going to be something that takes place, uh, and so once we got a fit of a handful of people that just all meshed, and I mean it was a family business, sure. and so well, and there's certain personalities for certain parts of the job. Like you need the face, you know, like you need the winky. Mm -hmm. to like be the the front man right. right right and then you need you need the bass player the person that's back there you know like stocking beer and shit like that well so you got uh, i mean winky is a is a perfect example i if you say you're going to poos uh pax and winky yeah. are like 
Yeah, at, at least that's how it was for me for a long time. Sure. And I mean, uh, Taylor Todd too for a oh, little yeah, bit. Oh yeah, of course. But, yeah. yeah. But <laughs> so it the personalities are definitely a thing, and we, we had those in spades for their for their different. For the different aspects that they brought to the Everyone's table got their themselves. strengths, yeah. you know, and you plug in the holes where they need to be plugged in. And sometimes, for better or for worse. Yeah, I mean, I mean a, lot, a lot of times for worse, but still, like, you know, people take away uh, a uh, a memory of a place more than, like, oh, I didn't get a drink in the first five minutes. You know what I mean? Like, they yeah. can forgive things like that. They're like, oh, it was so much fun. That guy was, or that girl was so entertaining. And uh, especially there, you could tell that all of you guys were kind of friends first. Or and family, obviously, because it wasn't like there wasn't a lot of wild card uh, employees there that I noticed that were like, oh, Dave again, you know. I I think that Dan just knew how to. Uh, Dado Dan or, or no no older brother junior Dan. okay uh, the the eldest brother eldest brother. So I think that just with his experience uh, when he was GM at Locos. It, it just, he was able to kind of rein in the rodeo. He knew how to run the rodeo without there being. Managing personalities. A, yeah, a, a bull that just yeah. takes out every clown. <laughs> and, <laughs> so you said when you started there, you were bar backing. You were pretty young, probably not of age to bartend yet, I guess. I was. Or, cl or close at least. I was 19 when we opened. Uh, so you think the experience, so. Uh, you know, like uh, certain chefs, they start as a dishwasher and then they go to salads and then they go to cold right. prep and shit like that. As a bar back first, do you think that informed your uh, your prowess and ability to be a better bartender because you knew what that took? Absolutely. I think it's a necess necessity. And if if you're working a line and never washed a dish before, then you need to start your job over. In, in, in my opinion, I mean... I I worked kitchen for a little while, but uh, not for me. I mean, it is for some people. I love to cook. I could never do it in a restaurant. I know that. Like but, high high volume, high intensity uh, yeah, chefing. The, yeah, yeah I, I I don't think I could deal with a chef over my shoulder or a kitchen manager, depending on what level you're cooking at. Like, that's some in, intensity that pressure. I, uh, yeah, tickets coming in, going. It's up, also yeah. behind a closed door. Sure. So, like, you don't know what how what brutal is <laughs> until yeah. you're in the yeah. fire, yeah, and jump out of a frying pan into the into the yeah. the campfire. I mean, well, your experience uh, coming up through Livewire and you know learning all the stations and the spots. Do you think it was a little more uh, nurturing because it was family based? You know, your managers and coworkers were family. Or is it worse because they're your brothers, and we we all know how brothers can be to each other. So, I, we all had our realms. Uh, I mean, Brendan was very much on the production side of things. Amazing sound sound guy. Yeah. Daniel was a great people manager, uh, to this day still is. Uh, shout out Livewire Athens. Uh, but so he's a great people manager, and and then. We just had the ability to uh, just work. It, it just worked. And, and because so you all they had both... your specific spots. Right. You don't want a lot of crossover getting each other's way. And then here's younger brother that worked both and it was kind of also honed, uh, just skills honed by Dano Sr. to be a people person, be a talker, be a salesperson. So. Yeah, because like, that was one of the very specific things I remember. Dano being, uh, you know, when, you know, if if Daniel is, you know, a little stressed at the job or, you know, people are busy, Dano was always the levity, like, hey, what's up, man? What well, do you think I should move this poster from over here to over here? You know, he's the, it, he, he brought like a, not a, uh, not like a, a childlike perspective to it, but he, he, he definitely brought in the. Uh, so, so someone else put it best at one point. And uh, Brennan and I have joked about this for years. I'm not sure how far out it went, but he's our Frank from Patty's Pub, Always Sunny. 
He he that, was our Frank. That's a such a great way to <laughs> like, put it. Yeah, I, less. I mean, controversial, but, gross. But, yeah, things. And not well, as I insane. can't say less controversial. Yeah, but there not are as insane. And he's not he's not drinking um, uh, suntan lotion or anything like no, that. No, <laughs> no, no. Um, there were definitely yeah. some times where uh, we we could yeah. we could question his his uh, decision making. Sure, sure. But that I mean that's everyone. And not to be too much inside baseball, just for a little clarification. So Livewire, it, it's you, your two brothers, and your dad opened it. So the, those were all the roads. So when we're talking about Big Dano, he was you know owner, operator, whatever. You yes, all sir. you guys were owners, oper- owner operators. Um, so whenever you guys uh, did get in there. Was the um, the intention from the beginning to uh, sort of go uh, music first uh, and provide music first, and then if you decide you want to have food later, which you guys didn't start with food, but you did start having food at some point. So we we kind of actually we had intended to open with food, and the kitchen had it, it was only partially done. We ran out of time. So we actually partnered up with Two Bubba's Barbecue for the first uh, for the first St. Patrick's Day that we were open, and the original Livewire shirt actually has both logos and has a little pig with the Livewire lightning bolt. Uh, two uh, Bubba's that was a drag right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so, so he and his brother, and so we we did kind of start out with food but it was they had their own restaurant and it was more of a they were doing like, like pop-ups at your place right. sort of and, thing yeah yeah and so they would they would fill the the void but we had intended on having our own menu but we didn't have a cook in the family to take you got every other role uh, covered yeah, by the family except so, the cook yeah. so that fell on daniel's shoulders okay and I mean, it was just, it, he was already dealing with a lot. Outside exactly. Of it. Yeah. It, it was just, it, it wasn't the right play. Sure. Yeah. And open up any business at all with three out of four legs on the ground. And they're going to be known for those three out of the four legs. Right. And that fourth leg is, is yeah. amputated right. almost every time. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. That's, yeah. That's a smart, that's a, you know, a smart assessment of it because if they, I just came up with that metaphor, well said. but hey, well said. Hey, we're freestyling here. This is jazz, baby. <laughs> uh, speaking of jazz, did um, did y'all already have through? I guess maybe through Vince, uh, former owner of Gag News and you know partner in Livewire. And by uh, um, did you have um, uh, an end with him? Did, I'm sure he had an end with a lot of traveling acts, like music acts. Is that how you guys got started with? How, who and how you were booking these bands? So we we had already had the the production company. Oh shit! Yeah. Okay. So we were. I I'd started working at Locos downtown when I was fourteen, running food and as an expediter. Brendan and I were running the Livewire Sounds Inc. Doing sound there. Yeah. Oh, you. Daniel were... was GM there. So and if that is actually. Know, that, yeah. If people that, don't know Locos was. I mean, for, for a time, like the live music venue in Savannah that like booked, you know, decentish bands. Yeah, they they were more than a deli and pub or bar. Yeah. Or, 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 well, they had a whole yeah, room on the pub. side where they would clear it out, and it was a big stage. the The sound was always great. I enjoyed playing there because it was like they took care of you, and it was an actual room to play in. Yeah, sure, there was a restaurant on the side, you know, but. And they were mostly a restaurant and bar until they had music on the weekend. You know? Right. Yeah. As, I mean, as long as it wasn't a game day or a Georgia game. And yeah. yeah, then they they suited what was needed in Savannah for what we what they could do. And and so that's actually a big part of the Livewire story because Dano saw his three sons under one roof all doing things to like just side by side wheels start turning he's a natural businessman exactly and so uh i guess there's a lot of things that i was too young to be brought in on certain conversations you weren't in the advisory role right you're not bringing your 19 year old son to a business meeting with two potential partners and a booking agent 
And yeah, I mean that that's yeah, exactly. So junior and senior did their thing. And, uh, our, we had a number of contacts just through that. I don't want to say through locos, but through the exposure of that and, uh, Wagatail was, uh, I mean, we were partnered up with Wagatail. Wagatail, that was a pretty big production yeah, company. Yeah, Ben Baruch. And, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And so. They have some big name acts under their wing. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I would say that he he definitely, or uh, he and, I mean, Wagatail was his company. So uh, was aching to bring good acts to Savannah because he knew the Savannah scene would su- at least somewhat support it. And so, yeah, because like, inherently in Savannah, there's a million like good musicians that play at every bar, but not a lot of people that go out to see them because they're like, oh, it's just a local act. So bringing in outside acts that would, there's a market there for some that yeah. Savannah could support. Oh, but I heard uh, one successful touring act say multiple times, I don't like playing my hometown because. They played there so much early in their career that it was next to impossible for them to actually draw a decent crowd. It's not an event anymore. They, you know, if they could see you next Friday, you know, or if they've seen you every other Friday for the past couple of years, and then you become a little bit bigger and you come back home, you're not. It's not an event anymore. It, yeah. Well, it, it's also like, oh, well, we'll see them the next time they come through. Yeah. And I mean. Yeah, that's, that's, a hard, a, that's a whole philosophy in itself. Yeah, no, understand. But, and that's a hard, that's a thing that most people don't, uh, you know, might not have the uh, a perspective on. Support your local musicians. Yeah, support <laughs> your local musicians, please. Um, and touring ones, but. Well, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, so having, um, I guess, the idea all coming together at the same time, you know, dad sees his three sons working in a capacity that would work. And then. Uh, Fairly conflict free. And which is amazing to me because like brothers inherently are going to be chippy with each other. But I guess since you guys occupied such different spaces within, within the business, you know, there, well, the separation of labor yeah. certainly helped. And, That's the, yeah. and so I, I worked under Daniel starting when I was 14 and I don't know how many times I was fired from Locos, but, <laughs> uh, but I don't hold the record. I, yeah. I know that. I don't hold the record. I'm not gonna tell. I'm not gonna say who who held, holds the record for fire rehire. Uh, but it was a fellow delivery driver. Okay. So, okay. And so so yeah so yeah. Uh, we had we had kind of I guess kind of figure shit out as time goes on like what buttons not to push. Sure. And what buttons to push to get your way. And so. Yeah, you always hold that little trump card in your pocket. Like, uh, if, if all else fails, I know I can be like, well, you could have lost 20 pounds. <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you wouldn't, walking up and down the stairs wouldn't be so hard for you. And you could carry those kicks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Maybe you should be five years younger before you complain about your knees going up and down two flights of stairs. <laughs> but, you know. Uh, speaking of bands that you guys booked, so um, it, just before we started the show, I, this memory popped back in my head. So, like I said, you guys um, have a, were always super supportive of, of me and the bands that I was in, or like solo projects or anything like that. So, I was in a uh, way back in the day. I was in a little band called Mr. Wiley, whoop, whoop. and you. I still, I still have, I think, y'all's one of y'all's earlier shirts. Really? Yeah. Oh, uh, shit. Terribly designed shirt, oh, I course, might yeah. add. I'd, but we were mere babes. Uh, but it was a either I would say a dark tan or a light brown on a darker brown shirt. It was brown and brown, <laughs> and the logo wasn't like anything it wasn't that poppin'. popped. It wasn't poppin'. anyway, but it might have just been it might have just been font like a funky font. I can't. Yeah. I, I really was, wish uh, I would have thought it was about new that. Time, new times were last time I was yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> So speaking of brown on brown, what I was about, I, so so uh, touring bands would come around, and uh, a lot of touring bands they don't uh, 
they don't come with a supporting act, an opening act, whatever. So George Porter Jr., the bass player for the fabulous meters out of New Orleans, George Porter was coming to town to play a live wire, and they wanted a supporting act. And they asked you guys, hey, do you have a local supporting act that like does like funky stuff? And you go, yeah, this band, Mr. Wiley. So we get the call. They're like, hey, man, you guys are like, uh, would think you're in line to open for George Porter. I was like, it would have been junior. Yeah. I was like, yeah, ju- yeah. I was like, I was like, Sh- shut up. No shit. So then, you know, about two weeks out, we, we, we get the call. And it's like, Hey man, uh, you're not on the show anymore. And I was like, what? why? And they go, well, they, they saw your online presence, which our online presence at that point, I think was MySpace, And we only had two songs on there. And the names of those two songs were shit parade <laughs> And talking shit. I know who Shit Parade was about, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lord. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but so these very professional musicians from New Orleans and, and legendary bands were like, oh, let's see who these guys opening for us are. Shit Parade, talking shit. No, get the get these brown on brown. Motherfuckers. They probably saw the, sh- <laughs> they saw the shirt too. They go brown on brown. No, so we literally lost a gig because we named our song "Stupid, <laughs> Stupid." Oh name. man! For for those listeners who are listening, band names and song names do matter. <laughs> they do matter. You think you're being funny? You'll lose a gig. Shout with a- out <laughs> Johan Harvey on that one. <laughs> so uh, let's um, uh, we'll get back to live our stuff um on the on the second half, but let's talk about what we're drinking. So and you not consuming alcohol anymore so number one thank you for buying me this bullet 10 year it is fantastic especially when you mix it with an evra from Firemaker beer so you have a spiritless spirit yes um and i tasted it earlier so it's like it tastes like bourbon essentially but without the alcohol bite yeah and it's with got it, a little without as much note. back to the or kick to yeah. the back of the teeth kind of thing as you would expect from I mean, it's pretty much exactly what you might expect. Yeah, exa- no, exa- if you could describe it anyway, it's like bourbon without the alcohol. I mean, I'd say you taste it and you're like, here comes the, oh no. Yeah. So It's like the smoothest one you'd ever have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, I wonder why it's so smooth. Oh yeah, because it doesn't have that alcohol bite on the end. So when you when you pulled up, I've, I saw you a couple of weeks ago, but I noticed how svelte you were. And a lot of that you said is... I'm sorry. <laughs> you're very thin and fit. Uh but you Thank attribute, you. I worked very hard on this. <laughs> you attribute a lot of that to, you know, not drinking alcohol anymore. So what was the impetus for you to stop drinking? Um, just doing better, being better for myself and for my wife and uh, just longevity of life uh, and actually experiencing what every, like, what, remembering the experiences that life has to offer and having the energy to do so so um there's a thing that that was unrehearsed by the way uh, 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 (laughs) we're we're jazz here baby a thing that um people outside of the service industry uh might miss is like so say you don't work in an industry where alcohol is present all the time you're an office worker you know whatever construction uh you're not surrounded by alcohol constantly. If you do go out and drink, you might go out on the weekends and drink. And I mean, if you're like, you know, redneck guy having a couple beers after work, whatever, you're not really a drinker. As a bartender server, typically four out of five nights that you work, if, you, if you're getting off and going to drink somewhere else afterwards to decompress, or you're drinking, you know, while you're at work, or you're just in the culture of drinking. So, you not drinking for a year or so, you're like, oh, I feel like probably 80% of the population does you that know, doesn't I, drink I that really, much. I don't know. I've always like I've always been in the service industry up until I guess I guess it's been what year is it? 2024? 2024, I think. So <laughs> so I I got I got into insurance and finance, which is where Dano, I was following Dano's footsteps yeah. and, and got out of the service industry. And uh, so in, at, at the sake of just feeling the imposter syndrome, I imagine this is what normal f- people have felt like. But 
every drinking's just so socially acceptable in the industry in the service industry that it's almost prerequisite if you're not doing it well it's it, almost socially unacceptable it it it's weird when you finish a shift and don't flip to the other side of the bar sit down and have an r and r beer at the end uh, at the end of the night like it I would be like, oh, well, what did we do wrong to Bob? Uh, well, I, don't, yeah. I don't think I know any Bob that actually bartended with me ever. Bartender but, Bob, you don't remember him? <laughs> <laughs> every, but, every, but, every bar but bartender, bartender Bob would always go home and the rest of the staff would be like, what the fuck did we do? If he doesn't come out if with you. If he doesn't come out, oh, not just come out, even just sit down. For one second, yeah. For one, for one quick drink. It, it is the fabric that keeps, because... You get off work, you have a drink, and you're like, hey, remember homegirl from earlier? Yeah, she was a bitch. Remember dude from earlier? Yeah, we had to kick him out, whatever. That's where you uh, essentially, like, all your decompression time happens there, and then you don't take the shit home with you. Right. Yeah. You, you you're not going home it. to the wife or the husband. The, like You spit it out in the empty can that is your shifty, and that's it. This is the most quotable podcast I've ever done. I'm telling you, we're five mean, or six I mean, deep <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so you've no, it, now, uh, you said you'd come to Huckapoo's, you know, not drinking and like, it doesn't quite hit the same, but, a but you direct get direct quote from earlier. Uh, yeah. But you get what you need from the, the social aspect of it a little bit quicker. Cause typically when you're drinking, you're like, oh, I don't want to go. We're having fun. You know, like, I don't want this to end. I know whether or not I'm going to have fun five minutes into arrival. So I'm planning my exit. At that point. Yeah, because if you're drinking and you show up, you're like, I'm not having fun yet, but... Right. If you're not... Uh, if you show up somewhere and you're not having fun or know that you're... Like, you gotta... You gotta work at having fun, then that work comes in the form of a shot of Satan's piss. And... Yeah. Uh, and or... Well, that, that's throwback to Jeff Rowe, But... Um, yeah. But... Yeah. So... The other night, like obviously, I told you about the mix-up on calendar dates and thinking that it was when Ben Kaiser was playing. Yeah, you thought you were was, going to see a Ben Kaiser. It was the show. day day after, yeah. so mix-ups still happen when you don't drink. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> but so five minutes into it, uh, I mean, I I knew that it wasn't going to be what I what I was expecting it yeah, to yeah. be. So I was like, okay, well, it's not that so. That's okay. I haven't seen a couple of people that are coming up here. So I'm going to hang out with them for a bit. And then we're going to call it a night. I've gotten my fill. Exactly. And it probably feels good to be like, hey, you know, I didn't I didn't have to work for my good time or 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 titrate booze just to just to assimilate to the people around me to be on their level. Well, it's 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 also well. I've never had an issue paying or affording a Huckapoo's tab, so uh, I'll 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 we're preface, famously cheap. <laughs> uh, I'll I'll preface that, but uh, oh, I didn't even think about the money part. But of the it. Like, the financial aspect of yeah. it is is not Wait. inconsequential. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah. Oh, the Irish exit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you say goodbye to me. Sort of. Yeah. You. I. I. I try to say bye to everybody I can, but even if you didn't, I wouldn't give a shit. Cause I, I, <laughs> well, I there's some people you don't have to say yeah, bye yeah, to. Exactly. Yeah. And there it's and a bye. Are, yeah. And, <laughs> and <laughs> sometimes no goodbye is a bye. Someone sent me this, uh, this short, a uh, couple days ago. They go, uh, Hey, uh, you have a doppelganger in, uh, in, uh, in the Eastern part of Europe. I was like, Oh, a doppelganger. And I popped it open. Let's talk alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> Vodka tastes and smells like high-grade gasoline that is made fit for human consumption. But it's not about the taste. It's about the level of the mental withdrawal that you can achieve with it. Vodka is a time travel fuel. Drink a liter or two and skip 24 hours. There are masters that can actually skip weeks and even a month at one go. Have fun until you wet your pants. Sure, vodka will not solve any of your pro problems, but 
what if you don't remember what your problems actually are? Isn't that pretty much the same thing? Sage advice from apparently my doppelganger, but I was like, look, man, I'm not a vain man, but <laughs> doppelganger and looks, I don't know. But then she goes, yeah, he's your doppelganger because you guys are both hilarious. I was like, oh, thank God. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't think I look like this. Well, I, I was going to say he might be your doppelganger if you time traveled for months at a time like he suggested to. <laughs> Like, if I took the two month <laughs> time travel period yes, with the vodka, <laughs> if you use the vodka for time travel, but Little that's the wear and tear. So they thought it was um, a plutonium and Back to the Future, but it was actually it was actually vodka. <laughs> the uh, the waning days of Livewire uh, are. I, I, I have to say, I was really. Expecting to see Unscrot. <laughs> right, right, I was well. That's the thing. I was like, I'm enamored with his uh, with his accent, you know. I, 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 <laughs> oh, I was just expecting like somebody to be like, oh, I found your doppelganger. Oh, and, the, and, and it was, then and it was it'd me. be like your character from five <laughs> the, years ago or ten years, whenever, however long ago. I guess that shit. That was fifteen years ago. Twelve years 12 ago, years? dude. Ouch. Twelve. I told you I was old, man. I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of toast machines and, and internet searches. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that might have been your intro to to using the the bleeps and bloops on, oh, yeah. on a pad. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because <laughs> I had just gotten it, and I was like, uh, "What what do uh, Europeans do with their music?" I was like, "Oh, they just they do the same beat, and then they just switch. You know, they just stick a little tick a little instruments on top of it." Um, the waning days of Livewire. Uh, one of my fondest memories is Livewire Music Hall. Livewire Music Let's, Hall, Savannah. Yeah, we uh, we have to specify there because yeah, Livewire yeah. Athens. Yeah, because now while it's not a, a concert venue on the day to day like Livewire Music Hall was, it is a very strong business. Yeah, it's um, open. <laughs> yeah, because uh, uh, they do like um, they rent it out for like. Uh, parties and shit like it's, that right? it's an event venue event, uh, uh, event yeah. and concert venue yeah. so or you could just say venue but sure yeah. sometimes that specificity is 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 a necessity uh, specificity is a necessity that's gonna be a rhyme one day <laughs> it already is uh, but but yeah so just because to what, get the point across sure, that yeah. we do both and when we first opened it the intention was to be more of what Livewire and Savannah was on a more grand, yeah, uh, just bigger scale. It was bigger because you guys took over the New Earth. It, before it was Livewire Athens, it was the New Earth Music Hall. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. it, which was already a turnkey built in space you know like to, yeah not, space uh, it yeah, was not turnkey like all the equipment wasn't necessarily there but uh, it was a space for booking bands right so people were familiar with the brick and mortar but there is a double-edged sword because i mean there were some aspects that were for the athens area as endearing as livewire music hall on river street as far as the scene goes there's a lot of people that like have that love for new earth but then there was the dark side of it where there's a lot of baggage that comes with some places, especially if they were going out of business. And so we ended up buying the building. You mean baggage from like uh, the uh, the local supportership of the people that are like, oh, you know, I'll I'll never go here because uh, I like the old place better, and it's, it acts as if it's your fault that the other place went out of business. Um, yeah, some of that, and uh, I mean, bad debt. And I mean, there, there's all kinds of uh, spectrums of baggage. Oh, sure. And, yeah. Like, a, like a, if something was bad structurally uh, within the building or like the that. electrical in that building was not great. Sure. Yeah. That's, thankfully, that's it's not an issue about, anymore. Yeah. But um, but it, it's some some of it is just relative to how people thought of that location. So uh, w one of the former owners of new earth uh was our partner and we ended up buying the building and not buying the business essentially 
uh, and it was a strategic move because the business was not run well. Yeah, there was no value in the actual buying the actual business because that would have been. But so you were able to get the building, but obviously you didn't. It's, you it's, it's a very keep... nuanced situation, to sure, be completely yeah, honest. Yeah, no, and I got you, and yeah. so again, just like with the Livewire Music Hall, I wasn't the business person on. You weren't on the board. You weren't on the yeah. board for that. Actually, yeah. I wasn't. You're neck down I, guy. I, I wasn't <laughs> even really. I wasn't even really necessarily in the equation when it came to, are we going to do this again? Until it was like in the grasp of possibly doing it again, and well, and maybe this, the the necessity of needing you. They're like, hey, we we're here now. You want to come up to Athens? Pretty much and it's, help. So I mean, it was a group text before everybody and their brother had eighty group texts. But put me in a group text, I'll pistol whip you. Uh, <laughs> so and and it was, are we doing? Are, are we really going to do this are we, again? Are we going to do it again? Yeah. And I, without question, there was a lot of hesitancy. Sure. Did all, all right. you guys go in though? You, Brendan, Dano, and Daniel? Uh, we we all said yes. Okay. I mean, we were all like, yeah, well, let's do it. And so. But that meant moving from Savannah to Athens. And Daniel yeah. was already up there. Yeah. Obviously. So I, I, Daniel had already moved up there and uh, w- worked a- alongside or within the industry. Yeah. And uh, while up there, ran into some people that we had worked with as touring bands and uh, and different venues, different uh, booking agents. And, and so he had already talked to Brendan. I guess Brendan was the second person to really be brought – oh, second brother to be brought in on it uh, in terms of and, the well, conversation okay because him being the production brother i mean it's it's for kind a music of, venue that's pretty key to exactly. have the production and it's pro- it's nice to have that guy in house as well because if i know anything about sound engineers sound guys they're not the easiest people to work with you know or they can either be really easy or really difficult brendan i love you uh, but yes, uh, couple that with them being your brother. That's what I was saying. So anytime I've worked with Brendan in terms of, you know, me being a musician and him being sound, he's always great. He's like, Hey, do you need more kick in your monitor? That's fine. But if you, as a business, you have to hire out for a sound guy, you can have a sound guy coming in. Like, uh, how are we going to work with the space right here? Uh, uh the 440 kicking off. The, the back wall over there uh, once you start talking frequencies yeah. that's when <laughs> that the, that's when if it like especially it later in the the live wire music hall river street years once that started happening that's when i pulled him in i and daniel wasn't always there obviously eventually i grew up a little bit and had more uh more of a managerial yeah status you went from neck down to uh, your head to, down. to i was i was settling with some major artists at the end of yeah. the night and yeah. um like being the face of the business yeah. and so sometimes that can be nerve-wracking especially when it's an artist's sound guy for someone i mean this this wasn't necessarily a case but like g love or uh, George Porter Jr., Tim Reynolds Trio, like you get uh, people like that, and their sound guy comes in, and they start bringing up frequencies in a brick hallway, basically. Yep. That that's not for me. Uh, yeah, I mean, you don't have the RAM for it right then. No. You know, it, it, especially if you if, if you don't work inside of that world. And funny you bring that up. Uh, the first time I was ever really privy to our right, big bigger bands. You know, and you guys at Livewire, especially, you guys book like, you know, very notable bands. And with very notable bands who are very professional and very good, they bring with them a sound guy who understands what the band wants to sound like. And the right. bands have an expectation of the sound guy. The first time I was really privy to that, I went to uh, Coach's Corner and it was uh, Kevin Kenny uh, and the something star, like whatever his like new iteration of his band was. 
and his sound guy goes up there and he starts chirping on the mic. He goes, he goes, uh, uh, the, the, the 444, we need to cut that by two DBs at the, at this Hertz. I was like, oh shit, there's some very, you know, ultra specific, very, you know, incredibly te technically difficult things to accomplish. It's a science. It, <laughs> oh, the, some, some people still have their ears if they haven't been blown out yet, <laughs> yeah. like, the, the, those sound guys that learned how to preserve their ears are the ones that are probably the most successful. 100%. They're a tuned machine. They're, their ears are a tuned machine. But I don't know if that actually exists, a sound guy that hasn't blown their ears <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah. I, will, I will follow up with that. Sure, yeah, but yeah. It's probably a hard thing They to just have so. adapted to, yeah. well, I can't hear that frequency <laughs> yeah. anymore, so uh, I'm going to use this iPad. Right, yeah. Uh, Motorhead, uh, they made a shirt. It was like uh, everything louder than everything else. That's what they would tell their sound guy. They're like, no, 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 just make mine louder. No, it make everything louder than everything else. <laughs> yeah but to bring it back full circle yep. but it, having having the brothers as a as a team and now our sister's actually involved and in works at livewire athens but having uh that that team really assisted a lot because it was slave labor we were broke i mean uh when i say we i mean the we we were making money obviously but we were you weren't cashing fat checks you were making money uh, but everything goes uh, back into uh, the business exactly yeah so you're and working we were we were towards, living we were living broke i yeah, guess yeah. it would be the way you were working way towards to something but you're not like hey end of the week i'm cashing a fat check it's like right. no like you're we were making a living but yeah. not you were, you were not a great living yeah you were living yeah you were just living yeah um uh, but at the end of the day the experience without question is always 100 percent. i may have underplayed my involvement a few different areas you, you have you've been humble man but, but like yeah uh, but i've opened i've been opening staff and management of three different venues and in two different cities yeah. savannah athens and then savannah again with victory north and you you mentioned uh, or what triggered me to even bring this up is you like you mentioned the resume thing well uh, there's no coincidence or it's no coincidence that i came i moved back to help open victory north it's the size venue that savannah has always needed that could bring the big enough acts that savannah would support without it being uh so much overhead that it was impossible to make it worthwhile for the band the promoter and the venue sure and well, so it, it filled a gap where there was a live wire sized venue right and then there was the civic center right right so something in the middle like you know 800 seat whatever you know you got the civic center which is very big you know you got your willie nelson and your, you know your fucking whoever is there and then you know your smaller bar venues you know it was the perfect stop for the georgia theater playing bands who were headed to jacksonville or exactly wherever. headed to florida or uh or headed to Fle freebird used to be Freebird. yeah, yeah. When, when I, or, yeah, yeah. or janice live or because there, savannah was not a stopover right back then because there wasn't a venue at, at the mid size for certain bands to play right yeah and so livewire music hall filled that niche for a long time until we didn't and then even after we closed we did a few shows in a few different places uh predominantly at dubs and that little upstairs yeah yeah dubs uh, club down on river street yeah, yeah. so so we we did there for for a bit until we threw the little festival but but when i started like when i had the opportunity i think i was visiting in 2018 before uh, and was having a beer at uh two tides shout out local brewery uh it was two blocks away from this place this project that a buddy of mine was the salesperson uh for stage front this this upcoming venue that wasn't even 
going to be a music venue at the time. It was just going to be an event venue at the time. You talking about Victory North? Yeah. And so it was in complete disarray, just a shell. Uh, what was it before? It was an antique store. That's so, a big antique store. It was a Good. huge antique God. store. How many antiques? Jesus. It's, uh, Oh man, I wish I could remember the name of that antique store because it was actually a really good one. But uh, but yeah, so I walked in there and it was the skeleton, but the mezzanine was still there. And anybody that's been in the industry for five minutes or been to a concert, uh, you walk right in and you immediately see the potential of what like yeah. this Georgia theater esque venue for savannah it is very very similar and you know structure and style to the georgia theater and there's something to be said for it things uh buildings that are just a skeleton it's so much easier to have a vision of what it could be without a bunch of you know right if it is just a skeleton you're like holy right. shit and it, it it looks like the theater it looks like freebird live kind of you know with the mezzanine up there right and that was my first thought when I saw it. Yeah. It's like, oh. It, it, it looked like it was begging to be a venue. Yeah. You know? And then when you get in there, it, after it was a venue, it's like, oh, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the history of that building is pretty, pretty cool. It was uh, an ice manufacturing plant originally. So it was almost an even more perfect Like venue. frozen water or breaking bad? Like like pre like pre refrigeration. Yeah, yeah. No. Um so <laughs> so uh so yeah, so the the floors were actually originally sloped, but the the owner Oh, they had to wanted, be sloped so that the water could drain out. So that the ice would use gravity to flow down or to I guess it technically would be a flow, but to slide down and then move off. And so and kick it into the truck. They yeah. actually flattened the floor be- so that weddings could set up tables and everything. Cause oh, it's going right, to be a yeah. venue first, not, yeah. Or it's going to be a, an event venue yeah. more than a concert venue. Yeah. Because the concert Just, venue, you want the slope any, floor. Anybody slope that would have opened it originally as a concert venue would have left that slope guaranteed. <laughs> it's the thing. It's and the natural amphitheater. Yeah, thing. Let the sludge go down to the front liners yeah. and let them stomp in that all, all night. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And well, and inherently like, it's better for it to slope away from the sta- slope up away from the stage because you're standing behind someone. Right. You're just, you can enough. see half an inch does a, a lot. That is what she said. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like there's, I, that one actually, it kind of irked me that they, that they, that they flattened. Yeah. yeah that, that's, mean, a, that's so unfortunate. It, it's, yeah. it's a small detail that if you never knew, you don't you, know, but you can note it. You'll notice, but you don't know why you notice. Right. And so, so that, oh man. But yeah, it, it was also a church multiple times. If you look up in the rafters at the stage, there's a sign that says, pray, maybe praise or, I don't know. It's still there. It was intentionally left up, but. Pray for a slope floor. Um, underneath the stage, there's a baptism bath. Shut yeah, up. So there's a concrete baptism bath that got filled in. Oh. So. So it's a cool spot. Like, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, a, a decent bit of history. You know, it's, it's, I was happy to come back to help open that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll let's talk about Victor North then. Um, so you uh, you brought me on to Bart's in there for two shifts, and the first one was some country, younger country act guy that apparently a lot of people love because it was a packed venue. And uh, so you brought us on and it was me and like a lot of uh, uh, my close friends in the bartending world. And, but all the shifts that I used the formula that I knew. Yeah. 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 You, if you got a good formula, they stick to it. And, uh, but it felt like everyone was a hired gun. Like uh, there's a, there's an app you guys, or they used. And if you were available home base, I think yep. it was called. And if you were available to work, you know, you could sign on to work. And I remember my shift was like me, you, Ashley Workman, a uh, uh, number of other people that, you know, really close to. And you were the manager at the point. And I just remember it was the first time I ever used a POS machine or whatever. And I got that down really quick. But what I didn't get down really quick was 
uh, not opening cans of beer with my fingernail. Oh. Because everything was a can. Oof. Besides liquor. Every, How quickly did you learn that one? I mean, it took me about an hour, but I was like, oh, it's black. My oh. fingernail is black. So then I started pulling my bar key out to, dude, talk about pain. and Yeah, <laughs> because we, I mean, it was super busy. And we opened, I, I mean, I opened 500 cans of beer. Yeah. But I just remember uh, end of the night, I was like, it's actually like it for as much um, volume and work as it was because you're making drinks or opening beers and you know, if they wanted a vodka Red Bull, there was a modifier. It's like, all right, vodka, which vodka? Okay, that's a, that's this number. And then, uh, oh, they want a Red Bull. All right, Red Bull modifier. Da, 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 da. But I, I, once I got into the groove, it was fine. But then at the end of the night, uh, we're counting up, and everything, even though this is a group of people that aren't always working there all the time, everyone understood the general system. We're out of there with money, you know, at a decent hour. Yeah. After a really big concert, and uh, how? What was your tenure there? Like, how long did did you manage there? This is actually pretty embarrassing. Okay. Uh, because it's probably one of my shorter stints, but it was set, well, eight months from the date of hire, probably. Uh, but there there were a, a number of reasons why we had to part ways. And I put it that way because going into it, uh, I knew what it was going to take to open that facility and how many man hours it was going to Did take. Did you have the mindset of I'm being I'm I'm coming in to help open and the future's sort of open ended? Or did you have the idea of like long term? I I'd, I'd planned on being there much longer than so Well yeah, obviously longer than yeah, I, yeah well, but okay. But, but at least a few years. I mean, I I I left a family business sure. to go open another business, and so. But you got the offer to do that because of your experience, and I mean, did it? It, it was a good offer. Having I imagine. beers with the right person at the right time, seeing sure. the space before it was yeah. really yeah. put into play, and I I really brought this up earlier. Because I, it wasn't a coincidence, live wired the name in Savannah. Like, it, not not to think that it's the hottest shit since sliced bread. But, but it does carry. But relative to the name live wire, sure. I mean, relative to the music industry in Savannah, it does carry some gravity. It, like, it, it, yeah. So there for a while, people thought that Dano Daniel Senior, my dad, was the owner. Oh, because they thought you were, that because you were the GM. Yeah. Uh, well, I wasn't the GM. Oh. I was I was the operational manager, and um, the, somehow food, I managed food and beverage. Yeah. Food, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Casino. so with with Livewire Music Hall being on River Street, and like me starting a bar backing, Daniel really just pushed me into the bar management concept. So Livewire Athens bar management. And venue management. It was a natural progression. For exactly. You. Like you're, you're gonna if, if if you're smart at all, you're gonna that, that's the direction you're heading in. You're gonna be you're gonna right. be good at it. Well, Daniel also wanted to get out of the day to day as a general manager. <laughs> Time and, to delegate. Man. So so he was like, I mean, he was more or less like grooming me to take yeah. care of Livewire, whatever iteration of Livewire it may sure. be. Me being the head of Livewire. He could he 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 could take time off or sleep well at night being like all right i know andrew's got it right it's and, not gonna fall apart well and, and then i had this conversation of, i think in 2018 after adding it up i was here 13 weekends out of the year like how do you know you need to move somewhere <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And, yeah. And I, don't, I don't when yeah. you're there a quarter of the year sure yeah that's a pretty telltale sign sure, so, yeah, yeah. maybe i should be there yeah. so my buddy he was like hey is this something that would interest you? And I was like, yeah, uh, uh, being one of the leads and one of the, uh, the biggest or the biggest like true concert. Uh, and, and the only one at that time. Right. And so, well, and there's a flattering aspect of it where it's like someone entrusting you, not just with running, you know, it in any capacity, but during the opening, that's a huge mm -hmm. time. And like, whether it be because they didn't necessarily have the experience that you had or they just needed someone with yeah. your experience. I mean, it's kind of flattering that, you know, that they would ask you to do something like yeah. that. Yeah. 
No, and and I I I took it to heart. It was amazing, and so I jumped at it. Well, yeah, and that'll motivate you too. You're like, I'm going to work hard as fuck because yeah. someone entrusted me with this. The thing is, I knew what the man hours were. I knew what I was worth, and knew what I would settle for in the beginning to versus, move yeah. versus down the line. Yeah, and versus scaling your pay for. Uh, I yeah. mean, you know, uh, say what you want to say. I wouldn't. I I refuse to do anything less than I think it was. So I I said that I would need twenty five dollars an hour if if I were to go hourly. That's kind of a. I really gave them a salary, and I said I wanted yeah. this salary. He didn't want to put me on salary before the venue opened. The the owner didn't, which I mean. I mean, there's a there's a re- refractory period. <laughs> yeah. Well, so so and it, he, I don't think that there was a realization of how much time and effort really went into the preparation oh, 100%. of well then maybe it would have behoo- it behooved you to be like hey if you want to do it hourly we can do that because you have no idea no how no much. i definitely yeah i said or i i said well here's a salary and here's an hourly and i can tell you which one will, might end up being well, more because well, I, I i was a little bit of icarus because i mean it, i cost too much I, I literally cost too much you're worth it though baby um so I think I was on track for 72 and I put, yeah. my, I put myself out there for like 45. And so that, but I mean, obviously if, if you go into it thinking like, uh, Hey, uh, in the beginning, you know, maybe I'll take a pay cut or because the, because of the future potential right, of what you could end up well, making. Yeah. So well, I, I'm not going to discount myself right? Uh, because I'm putting in those extra hours the opening night, well, I, I initiated conversations with the uh, with the first show that we had uh, with Brock Scott from Little Tyvee, which that was supposed to be a soft opening show, but it was Little Tyvee, so it quickly turned into the grand opening, and uh, and so. I was about to say, there's no soft openings around here, baby. We're all, <laughs> we're all hard openings. So I, I initiated conversations with him and uh, because we go back to like peewee hockey. We, we've known each other yeah. for our entire lives. And and so that kind of started to play or you know, develop. And I was at 420 Fest the morning of day one when we were talking. But – it just started this huge thing that was supposed to be a uh, quick and easy. Like let's, let's put the gears to test and turned out to be a 450, 500 person show. The POSs hadn't been used one time. Oh. And yeah. And so, so it was, it was amazing. Like, and of course there's going to be hiccups and yeah, issues, yeah, yeah. but it couldn't have been a better opening night. Uh, yeah, especially with a good band like Little Tyree and yeah, did, so uh, at least Wooden, Wooden Steel was a supporter oh, that no, night yeah. too. So I was completely surrounded uh, by a bunch of friends. Yeah, and capable people. Right o- on all levels. Yeah. Uh, so if any hiccups happen with whatever, mm-hmm. it, it'll most likely get worked out in some way and right. and not fall apart because people are too stressed well, or they're not used to the volume. Right. And Zero Mile uh, was I don't know if they're still. Uh, involved but they were heavily heavily in the booking and the start of victory north as well yeah and for the listeners that don't know zero mile does booking for georgia theater or formerly i i really am not up to date anymore yeah but uh they own terminal west they uh, owned and did booking for Georgia Theater, and yeah, uh, they have a net, zero mile specifically has a network of or had a network of five or six different venues in the southeast that yeah. they just webbed out. And, and Terminal West is a big boy, fucking right. Uh, uh, Georgia Theater, obviously, big right. boy, yeah. And yeah, and so that just developed this whole thing, and yeah, it was a great experience. But let me get back to why I wasn't there or why I'm not there anymore. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's 
it, it really is the overtime opening night. And the reason it popped into my head, I worked 23 and a half hours in a 24 hour period straight. I, 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 think people I, don't I didn't have the POS have set up because I was worried about this and that. And I didn't have enough lead time yeah. to get a bar set up because the number of man hours it, 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 that was necessary. Especially in a big new space. Just it wasn't understood. Right. So. You, you don't know. Yeah. I, I tried to explain it and it was lost on someone that was a financier that who's well accustomed to the industry now and is doing a great job. Victor, Victor North. Yeah. But on the floor, on the streets, on the, well, prior, in the trenches, they, they're, they're not familiar with that side of it. I think he is now. Well, obviously but now, at but the time, then, yeah, yeah a, a doctor from Chicago, yeah. awesome guy, great relationship with them. Still. Yeah. We text sell or text occasionally, uh, I still get Victory North distributor calls. Hey, I'm at your door. Can someone get this delivery? Because been, I'm the one that set up. Been six years the, now. I haven't yeah. been there. No, sorry. That's literally yeah, the conversation yeah. with them. I, ha I haven't worked years, there since 2019. <laughs> that's my first answer because I know who it is. Like, I see Southern Eagle or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I don't know yeah. who it is now. Still have but, relationships with those people. Yeah, no matter what. But like, I... I my phone number hasn't changed and I set up the, I set up the accounts. So like for yeah, whatever so, reason, so you I tell it, them, yeah. Hey, get the rep to change the account <laughs> phone number. Never happened. So, uh, but yeah, so it, it's pretty funny. It's, it's a good time, but that overtime was, was kind of like, and if they don't get it and they don't understand, uh, what it what it's putting on you and the stress it's putting on you and until they know personally and until they've experienced it themselves it's hard to explain or talk someone into understanding like hey this is it's a little more involved than you think it is oh definitely yeah and it's setting up a pos for anything less than a two button or like beer yeah. craft beer or domestic uh, beer craft beer uh, you're, uh, and you're well liquor like our our what I did for that menu was so curated. Like the wells, the well vodka was Tito's. Like that's what I remember it, that. I mean, uh, I, I did the well tequila I, was at well, well, well. My goal at the end of the day was thirty dollars a head. Like you walk in the door, I expect you to spend thirty dollars in alcohol. And I mean, not because I was greedy, but it just. You know, if you don't have a uh, shit vodka, you're coming there. It's an event venue kind of thing. But I wanted to be an affordable event venue. Event venue. Sure, but people are uh, people will take less umbrage with a ten dollar drink of Tito's than right. an eight dollar drink of well, like right, exactly. Well, well vodka. So is there right. like a per plate mentality where I need this much from this amount of people over the course of the night to pay for everything? Exactly. I mean, you're you're paying for atmosphere. Anytime you go to any bar, obviously you're paying for atmosphere. So, well, and as a pure venue, like your overhead is, you know, uh, sometimes a very expensive van. Yeah, four hours. And you're not open for the right. the you, amount of time you, that other, yeah. You, you pretty much have four hours to make your nut. To yeah. get, yeah, for, yeah, to get it all and, in. Uh, for the day. And I mean, sometimes three days in a week. Yeah, so, because how many, yeah, you can't so, book a big concert every goddamn night. Like, right. that, that's untenable. It, it's, there's a reason why private events are yeah. a mainstay for live wire Athens. And so, and there's a reason beers cause what they do at venues or at yes. Festivals. Yes. Or, uh, sometimes it is price gouging. Yeah. Like Bonnaroo, $8 waters. Yeah. It is price. But, gouging. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, it, it's, it's hard to know the full picture without being involved. Without, without actually being in the, in the shit for a little bit. Right. Um, speaking of, uh, Price gouging, my uh, bladder is gouging. Let's do a third segment. Yep. And welcome back. Segment three, rolling along. We were downstairs talking about um, the uh, uh, being in the business, uh, especially being around like musicians and booking bands, like uh, all the the bands you get to meet, you know, because you're booking them and you get to hang around with them. And as a musician, uh, you know, some of the, the memories that you, you know, 
it, it that spark up from you know like, oh shit man when uh this band played there we were sitting there after hours and you know i got to you know play with Jan rico scott like right you were saying and uh he uh r.i.p so he uh to to check your uh uh, uh what are they called uh, the calluses yeah <laughs> yeah so the, um i ike stubblefield is a close family friend that we met because of Livewire music hall in river street we we booked him here and just developed a rapport well he lived in athens so he the natural thing was that he ended up playing Livewire athens and so uh he would bring in just outstanding musicians to sit in with them sometimes in the smaller space and have a more intimate show and sometimes on the main stage well uh jan rico was on the main stage but uh ike wanted me to play and so i play percussion and so as we're sound checking and uh setting up and everything like uh, jan rico comes on the stage uh, breaks the leg of, of the curtain and just looks at me and grabs my hand and then slides his hand across the top. Oh, so to, it wasn't a caress. It was a, uh, uh, no, it was like it, swiping it, a credit card. It was, it was like, <laughs> let me see something like, and, and just to, you know, I, I guess that's a way to tell if it, someone actually yeah. fucking plays percussion. I, I mean, I uh, guess so, it yeah. makes sense. Shit can hurt. You know? It's, it's yeah. like the the braille of the music row is like, yeah, yeah. He plays like, percussion. It's especially natural like buffalo skin buffalo hide or uh or steer oh is I mean, that is that a little uh harder on the hands than like a synthetic uh i mean it's head? It, like imagine slapping hard leather all the damn time like it, it's you know, been a long time since i slept my yeah leather. exactly <laughs> the slapping skins um but but no so the the synthetic heads resonate they have a lot of like some of them say they don't have as good a tone, but. I mean, know. old heads be like, oh, I ain't slapping nothing but sheepskin, brother. <laughs> My condoms, sheepskin. I was skin. about to say, I thought that was <laughs> something else. No. So the, uh, uh, one of my like most fond memories is the last night of Livewire. Um, I was lucky enough to be one of the. I suited up for that. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah, you looked fantastic. With a Gumby shirt that said, here to party. <laughs> It's a three-piece pinstripe suit with a shirt that said "Here to Party." Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. no, I, no. I, it's, it is burned into. No, no, uh, it's welling back up into my memory. So, uh, yes, yeah, so it was the final night. We all knew it. Um, and I don't know if there's was there a band there that night. So. There ended up being a band. We created a band after right. hours for sure. So the night before was the last band booked. Was, and so the last night was Arch Nemesis, and which is awesome. I mean, but there were some local musicians that refused to allow a music producer DJ to or be what last. to be the last performance on that stage so biggie and uh i mean honestly like he's six foot six so he's the only one that really comes to mind but uh, i know that he was one of the proponents of the the last group that came up and I, i i don't know really who put it into play but it was a pretty natural like all right we're not letting this happen or letting a dj be the last performance everybody bring their stuff and i mean we already had probably the gretch kit yeah yeah there's already a from what i remember there's already a drum kit there and uh i mean there's always a drum kit there if, if bands wanted it but obviously if certain bands came in you know they wanted their own drums or whatever a lot of times i would play your guys's drums yeah, because they were better than mine, but I would just bring my own cymbals and snare or whatever. But uh, thank you, Paul Cooper. But we, but uh, so after hours, we um, yes, yeah, so we get in there and it's like, uh, Brendan's playing bass, I'm on drums, 
we play for a little while and then we just turn on the the house music for a little bit dance party and it was all the all the staff and then like maybe 10 other people you know and I think Robbie's left-handed guitar was in there, so I just flipped it over and tried to play it the other way, but just <laughs> pretended to play for a little bit. But I, it was just everyone, it was so joyful, even though we knew it was literally the end of like this very important era for all of us personally, yeah, but also for Savannah and the music scene of Savannah in general. And I just remember how joyous it was, and then you know the sun came up, and there's flashlights at the front door, I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, that's the police. We we need to go. And then the very next time I got back together with you guys, you know, the Robertsons, uh, m- my band Code of Money opened for Less Racket at Live Art Music Hall uh, Athens. And we we do the show. We go back to Daniel's house. And RIP Jesse, uh, mm-hmm. one of my favorite people in the world, uh, she was a bartender at Livewire, so she was up at Livewire Athens with us, and we uh, we played the show. We went back to Daniel's house, like not like party party, but you know, hung out. Next morning, we woke up, and Jesse was like, uh, "I've never had so much fun not sleeping because I felt like I was in a bear of den, a, 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 a den of bears." Because she was like, uh, it, it was like frogs in the night, like one person, and then over here, all these giant. Every recliner on every, the couch yeah, popped every out. out. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> every <laughs> four people on one couch or two couches yes. and uh, on the floor. Talking about bands that you guys book and like the weird uh, like riders that they had. <laughs> so uh, I didn't end up going to the George Porter show because I was salty. <laughs> but I remember you guys telling me afterwards they were like, uh, "Yeah, they wanted like a." Uh, um, lithuanian uh energy drinks uh water from you know the teat of a goose and you know well there's always the rider and then there's the the non-rider rider so there's there's some things that so let's hear the let's hear the the platonic rider uh what's the typical thing like uh certain bottles of water or I mean, alcohol everybody's heard of like nothing but the green m&ms yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. just that's, yeah that's yeah i'm i'm sure there's some asshole that does that but <laughs> yeah uh but i mean well that's famously just so that uh they knew that the venue was paying attention to the rider so jack, yeah fair so jack white did the um uh he had a recipe for guacamole that he wanted at at all of his shows. Okay. He didn't need the guacamole. He just wanted to, and he would put it at the bottom of the rider. So if they did provide the guacamole cut the way he wanted it to with the amount of limes in it, he knew that they were paying attention right. to the, you know, that they so, read the whole rider. So that's, yeah, the, that makes sense at the same time. For sometimes, a giant venue, but Sometimes not. the booking agents, there are some things that just get, struck and it might be without any artist ever knowing and sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. and but not make it to them and so that that can cause i mean communication is a huge sure. thing well what was your typical rider would you say like uh over the table I mean, rider because you you open uh, the can of worms a you're bottle like, of jack daniels okay. and pizza delivered uh, at the end of the show it, most people don't want pizza because i mean pizza's like what you get for the local band when you have to provide dinner. But when it's a touring band, pizza is the easiest thing for, a uh, for a venue to order. So it's the most commonly ordered thing. So touring bands don't want it. It's that simple. Um, All right, so- I mean, as far as food river, Str- a lot of people just do the buyout. Yeah. So, like oh, however, so however many dollars uh, you would have spent uh, on the rider, yeah. they'll just take it in cash. Uh, yeah, and so that comes in negotiations. And so, so what's um, the? Um, so, uh, what's, I'm what's, trying to. What's the other rider? You you, you open that. I, can I think you can imagine. <laughs> but uh, but uh, the good stuff. Like, the good stuff. I, I was I was a good kid and didn't fuck with any of it. Right. So yeah, 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 yeah. like I I don't know. But so you weren't on the committee for uh, uh, the the um, acquisition of no these, acquisitions were usually the, done by drum techs that <laughs> were traveling with the band too because 
They're dispensable. Those drummers, I, I don't, man. I, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, they, they have the role. It's explainable, like, that's, yeah. <laughs> and to the show. I mean, yeah, yeah. They, they'll make it to the bus at the next stop, but... <laughs> Is it, and we were talking about it downstairs. Uh, there's this um, uh, people perceive like uh, uh, everything about like a touring band or like how you run a venue. It's like oh, it must be just you know, it's just so much fun all the time. Like, uh, but it's not as glamorous. Like the roadies, you know, they're not. I mean, obviously they're a part of it, but like uh, the girls aren't going to the roadies. After yeah, that. I mean, there's some bigger bands out there that travel in a pretty small damn bus and i mean you get a nine piece horn band and a 15 foot sprinter bus i, I don't know like, how the I mean, did it as long pad. as they did <laughs> yeah or um uh funk you yeah uh, yeah oh but one person gets sick on a on a month-long tour all of them are toast i mean or on sudafed <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it's it, yeah, but I mean, you can lose one trumpet player if you have eight other horn players. I would imagine. I don't know. You would think, <laughs> but no, uh, no, that's really not what I mean. It's it, it just it's gonna pass. Like uh, you're yeah. in a van for four hours or however long driving oh, stop oh, to right. stop. Oh yeah, yeah. It's gonna pass. This yeah. is pre-COVID, so yeah. no one wore masks everywhere. You're in a tube of demons uh, getting sick with each other. <laughs> you're, you're bear of dens <laughs> yes, bear faced in the den uh, were there any suit like uh in terms of like bands wanting like cer certain shit where uh the, the, uh managing personalities and like expectations like were there people that were just like uh, unpleasable in terms of you know not not just the rider but like they get to the venue and they're like uh Where's the green room? Uh, well, I, I can't tell you how many times we forfeited the manager's office because the manager's office at Livewire Music Hall was massive. I mean, it was the size of two people, most two people's living rooms put together. And so that was always interesting. Uh, but yeah, in the historic building, it's it's kind of hard for people to have big expectations, uh, but well, even Virginia North, they have to kind of like come off the stage and then kind of mix with the public, right? Well, a bit. yeah. So there was no side stage at Livewire. Yeah, Music you weren't Hall, dipping off right? through a back door, and you, you had know, to walk uh, off the front of the stage, basically. Okay. And uh, this actually that reminds me of a a very uncomfortable situation for a well known musician. Uh, that just played this past weekend with their main project. But so it's a incredible guitarist that played for, well, anyway, regardless of, of everybody that he's played for, he was keeping his guitars under lock and key in our liquor closet. Or that was the, that was the initial plan. And then our buddy Derek, RIP as well, another fallen member. Uh, Great keyboardist. And uh, had the gift of gab and all his Derekisms. But uh, he made a joke about snagging it because he was working at Secondary Bar. He made a joke about taking Jimmy's guitar and selling it. <laughs> like a total off the cuff joke. <laughs> And those guitars never left Jimmy's side the rest of the night. I thought you were about to say, and then the FBI showed up. <laughs> like we no, heard you talking it, about, dude. That that shit was hilarious. Uh, like Jimmy, it, Jimmy. I don't know. He played this past weekend. Got him. Oh, I mean, I know who you're talking about, but I didn't, know, <laughs> I didn't know he played this past. So he kept his guitars at Livewire. Oh, he start. Uh, the, the plan was that they were in the liquor closet because again, there's no storage at that place. We wanted every every square footage for capacity, and so yeah, because uh, space is a thing downtown Savannah. Uh, you know, I mean, and I mean, everything's historic, so the building is the building. That's it. You if know, you've like, ever not, lived in a Victorian era home, not yeah. that we were in Victoria era, but the closet space is tiny. It's pretty much the same with 
any historic building, you got about a square foot of yeah. storage, and then and then the sink takes up a, a third of it. Right. There. Yeah. And so he set it down. They locked the door. Derek made the joke over the bar, and then five like less than five minutes later, came back and they went into the. I think they went back into the trailer until showtime. Yeah, showtime. One little, one little offhand joke. Oh well, know? I mean, it was Derek. It was yeah, totally yeah, yeah. a joke, but no, no, I mean, they don't, they don't know that, right? Joke. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And Jimmy's the type of guy is like, he's got his guitar, you know. Yeah, his guitar is his guitar. Exactly. It was funny. Well, dude, this has been amazing. Uh, we're gonna have to do it again. There's so much more to mine from this, uh, from this very deep well. Deeper and deeper. Deeper and deeper. And uh, as we go along, I'm like, man. This is a million things. Uh, thank you for coming in uh, and making the drive. Uh, once again, responsible by Firemaker Beer. Go to firemakerbeer.com. Andrew, Kelly, thank you guys. We'll see you next week. Thanks for having me.